Now we come to how far they move and how long they stay is controlled by the weather and the water conditions. Good and the bad and the present and the seasonal. Is the good and the bad in the present or in seasonal standpoint? This covers a lot of ground, but really, we're going to break this thing down pretty, pretty short so that we don't have to remember too much. Let's take the water. The reason I speak of the water, we look at it in terms of color. We do not look at it in terms of, of temperature, oxygen, pH, or anything. When we look at this water, we look for color. The most important observation that a fisherman can make is the water color. Now, number one is clear. Number two is a yellow green. Number three is a white sandy. Number four is a, a red sandy. Number five is a cypress or, or uh, we might call a swamp water or brown water. It's a cypress. It's a uh, tannic acid type water. Those are the five waters that I talk about that could be degrees in every one of them. Some of it, the clearer, could go and, and you could see down to 50 feet maybe, you know, and next time it's clear and you only see to 15 feet. But it's still clear. The yellow-green could go into different uh, categories too. The amount of yellow-green, how dark the water is. We look at it in terms of light. We're going to go on light the whole cockeyed way through here. So the number three is a white sandy, and number four is a yellow green, and this. Number five is normally in swamp areas, some rivers, and uh, more of a lot of, of uh, timber in it, and more of a swamp type uh, atmosphere. Number one is, and number two is normally the watercolor that you're going to have in natural lakes. You'll have some number five. You will have in natural lakes a quite, not too many, of number three, uh, which is uh, the white sandy. Very few natural lakes will you find the yellow, I mean the red sandy. That's usually associated with reservoirs, which has a muddy water and things running in it. Now you question before the house, it says, and this is what you and I, in our observation of water, why it's important. Now, instead of putting it in that, I'm going to put the categories of which is better, which is better and which is worse. The best one in that, to give you the best movement, the best fish, the best everything, the best stability in everything, more fish, more reproduction, just everything, is number three, the white sandy. Number four, I will put the red sandy. If it's uh, too red, of course, uh, it might not be, but you have a lot of, uh, of red sandy reservoirs around. You do not have hardly any uh, natural lakes that are red sandy. But I put them this way, three, then I put four next, then I put number two, and that is uh, yellow green, and then I put number one as number four, and five, I use the, the cypress or the tannic acid type water, the brown. That is a goodness. Three, four, two, one, five. Now I used to have one and five switched. I put number one in number five position, but as we came along with bigger lures and wire line and, and, and getting people to go downstairs, uh, which is necessary in the clear water, that uh, I said we can go downstairs with, uh, if we, as we go along in our training and presentation of lures. So I put it, uh, uh, put it number four. Then I move number five just as you see it here. Three, four, two, one, five. That you can beat your brains out a lot of those colors, especially one and a light two and a five, but one and five and two and a, uh, but number three and number four 
it's you have to see it, believe it. So I hope you keep this in mind. Slide. This is a yellow green, which is good. I imagine if you drop the white lure down in that yellow green in about uh, two, two to three feet, it disappear. A white sandy, you could get some white sandies uh, that and red sandies that would the lure would disappear within a foot, which would be good. Okay, then you clear water, you're allowed to see it down to 15, 20 feet. In the cypress, you can see it down a long ways if the sun is right. Two. But that's the yellow green. This is the color, or the yellow green. It's what most of the uh, most of the boys in the in the, the res in the lake, natural lakes, is going to have to be looking for. This yellow green will occur a little later in the sun in the summer after the, the algae start growing a little bit. But there are reservoirs. I mean, natural lakes, right up in Wisconsin, that has some white sandy too. And right next to it is a lake that's clear, clear as crystal, drinking water instead of fishing water. Slide. Now we come to the weather. My thinking about weather, and if you notice, there's no two days that will ever be exactly the same. There's always, they're always different. But this is the rascal that is your interpretation must improve as you do it. The interpretation of weather and interpretation of lake and interpretation of uh, controls and things of this nature, you'll always get to the, never get to the point you can't get better. Weather is one of those things that you, that you, you will, after a period of time, uh, you will have to uh, learn something about the weather, be able to interpret the weather as to the movement of the fish how active they are, how far they move, and how long it stays in fun the weather and the water conditions. Let's say you got the water condition, but this weather can mess everything up. And if you look at these weather maps, which you can see in your local newspapers, and right now and turn on TV and you see them all over the place, there's, we got a, you got warm fronts, you got stationary fronts, you got the concluded fronts, you got cold fronts, you got all kinds of fronts. You got all, all types of temperatures, just everything in there. You got a lot of cloud cover, you got everything in there. But there's a, our guideline, we're gonna have to pick something out of the weather that is a base that we operate from. And I think what uh, my conclu uh, conclusion many years ago was the fact I had to get the worst one. I'll start from screw uh, from zero, and then we'll watch it and see how it gets better and what to expect in the presentation of lures and how the fish is going to act, how far to go, and so on. The key that you and I in all that weather right there is cold front. slide. I, I used the cold front, the word cold front, and in this case that was really because that's an ice storm. A cold front actually is two masses of air where two masses of air come together. One of them is a warmer mass of air with, uh, with, some, with uh, a high moisture content. The adjoining area where they come together is a dry part, uh, uh, a colder air and, with, and dry with very little moisture content. Now where those two come together, that's cold front. Most of the fronts in the United States move from west to east. It may vary just a little bit, but that's a general thing because that's the westerly winds that carry our weather. They're up uh, 4, 6,000 feet up in that area, we say. But they carry the weather. so. The direction is, you can usually figure they're going to come from the northwest or the west or the, uh, the southwest and they're going to move toward the east. Now, northeast uh, a little, but mostly to the east. North from west to east in the United States. The cold front in this instance, uh, there was a great uh, difference in temperature between the two masses of air. But sometimes, and note this, 
their degrees of where the di temperature difference between the two glasses are. Sometimes it's so little that you will hardly know when it went through. But it still was a cold front. It still would affect the movements of the fish. See, this is the movement that we're talking about. This is their key as to how the weather affects, affects the movements of the fish. The whole our success is going to depend upon the movements of the fish. Slide. Now when the cold front goes through, it's uh, going to be clear. It's going to come up clear. It's going to be washed out. So the next day after the cold front, you can just figure that the rascal is going to wind up and it's going to be clear as a crystal out there. You may not know that, but I shot this slide with a, with a wide angle, but that's the moon in the daytime. See that blue sky? It's nothing up there. It's washed out. Now, the question is, I hope I told you to remove that slide. Sometimes I forget that, but we're up to where you see the moon in the middle of that clear sky slide. After that thing goes through, you're going to have some that first day, you're going to have some wind and it can be very, very high. It can run on some reservoirs and blow so hard that it'll just muddy it up. So you got a washed out sky and a lot of wind. Slide. What happens? I could put a, in a lake up there, a cross section of that thing, and you wouldn't see a fish on it. Because they're not up there in that sanctuary depth where they were, but they've gone down to the bottom. They, I've often said I believe they go to China if you had on certain types of weather conditions and clear water. But they, this is what happens to them on that. And let's, let's take five, four, five, four, five, six days here and see what happens. Slide. In most of the res most of the lakes and a lot of the reservoirs, after the cold front passes, they go deep, just as deep as they can go. Now that I bring in something else right here, that at this point about the activity of the fish. Terry, you can bring this in any time you want to, but I would, uh, right in this area is where I think I'd br probably bring it in. Now let's look at those fish. They've gone as deep as they can go in this body of water. Now if that particular spot is deeper than 20 feet and as far down as 20, 30, 35 feet, 40, or 50 feet, those fish are in good shape. And if they become active as, uh, and down at that spot and you're able to find them, that's, uh, that's fine. You'll be in business, but they're so deep and so dormant that you, you're going to have trouble. Something has got to happen here for the, the mass of us will be able to find and locate those fish down there. Now, if that depth is less than 20 feet, not, you would say, well, by cracker, we're in, we're in, we're in good luck. I can fish 20 feet, okay. I can fish 18 feet. Let's say it's 18 feet. I can fish 18 feet. I can jig a lure down there. I can, and so, but here's here's what it is. You remember our guideline, which it said, if they have water available deeper than 20, they always take 20 feet. Now, if they do not have that much depth, these fish are in trouble. They, they are exposed to a very unstable condition at, say, 18 feet. That's under these weather conditions. They are so dormant and so dead that you could practically 
stick him with a hook and not get him. Because he, he can take care. A fish can adapt to anything. He can adapt to temperature. He can adapt to pressure. He can adapt to food. He can adapt to most anything. He can adapt to oxygen, anything. You name it, he can adapt to it. But when he has to up around the 20, 18 feet or shallower, and he can't have no protection, no stability from the weather, he's in trouble, and so are you and I in trouble. He's, he's just not interested in nothing. Fly it. Now let's go to the second day after the cold front. I could go through the period of time right here I'm talking about, say the second day, could go to second or third day. But let's say the second day, uh, the second day after cold front. It could be still washed out, but second day or the third day. The first thing you're going to see is snowball clouds up around four, four, four thousand, four to five thousand feet. They're moving along quite uh, in behind those. It's, it's just clear, washed out. Blue skies. It just uh, slide. Blue skies, just washed out. How about the fish? This is the second day. They're still down there. A friend, Carl Maltz, every time he comes fishing with me, he brings those he brings the, those clouds. I don't care whether it's in Florida or California or, or even up north or in Canada. When Carl comes fishing to me, I call him the malt cloud because he always brings them with him. And this is what usually we hit this. We we'll hit this situation. Very rough. Uh, they're still down there very dormant. Now let's go, let's go to the third day. By the third day, you're beginning to see some moisture occurring upstairs in a higher atmosphere. You start to see maybe vapor trails or contrails of the airplanes. You may uh, see some high haze starting to develop upstairs or high cirrus clouds occur upstairs, slide. High cirrus start to form. Your Vapor trails will start trying to stay there and try and stretch out just a little bit. Now, when this occurs, let's say that this happened on the third day and uh, somewhere around uh, early in the morning, you could say. The fish move back to the shallow sink area. This is our guideline. By that third day afternoon when this thing develops uh, that the uh, higher cirrus uh, starts showing, the fish will move back. Well, maybe one or two of the smaller fish or maybe one or two of the big ones may venture so far as the end of the bar and then turn around and go back. Now the fourth day, uh, uh, they're back in the sanctuary, deep water sanctuary, 30 or 35 feet. Now we're going to move them from this point. They've moved from that cold point, cold front and the winter home, winter or cold front down to 50, 60 feet, and they moved back to the, their regular uh, average sanctuary depth, 30, 35 feet. They're back, uh, I'm going to back up uh, to this slide and I'll show you what happened. Uh, you see they're back up there now. Uh, if I go back a little farther, you'll see that uh, uh, they were still way down there in the, in the, in the cold front uh, condition. Then they went, uh, uh, by that third day, they, in high cirrus, then they moved back to the, to the sanctuary depth up there, there. To the sanctuary depth, 30, 35 feet. Now let's go to the fourth day. Well, this high cirrus is building up. The uh, contrails have uh, really just spreading out and staying there. Here you see in the high, uh, cloud cover get more and more high stuff. The cirrus is start building up. 
And let's say it in uh, this fourth day at about nine o'clock in the morning, it's in the summertime, let's say in the nine o'clock in the morning, these fish move. Now before you at that time, the by the time they start getting our high stuff, the wind has dropped and uh, uh, we don't have all that there. You see the cloud cover is building up in the background, the wind has dropped. The fish will move up to the break line at that uh, 15, 20 feet, 15 or 20 feet. They'll stay there a little while under those conditions. They might stay there 15, 15 minutes, 15, 20 minutes, but, and then drop back downstairs. Now at that depth, when they move up to there and they're there at 15 minutes, a good spoon plugger, he'll make his catch right there. The guy that's beating the shoreline, he'll never knew there's a fish around. And then they drop back downstairs. Now in the afternoon, about uh, let's say about four o'clock uh, on the fourth or fifth day, the the cloud cover is starting to build up, build up more building up more, slide, building up more, slide, and they, uh, what the fish do is uh, they, they'll move, leave the sanctuary depth and move up to the break line at 15 to 20 feet, just pause there just a little bit, case the joint so to speak, and see how the weather is and, and the light conditions and all that stuff is, and it's okay, so they move up to the, to the 13 or 10 to the 13 feet at the stump. They stay there for maybe 20, let's say 20 minutes. Then they turn around and go back downstairs. Here again, it's, that's, uh, that's, that's, that's like picking chairs to a spoon plugger. But how about the guy who's casting the weeds or casting the shoreline? He might catch a few small ones. But these are nice fish. Let's say that school of three or four pound bass or walleyes or whatever you want to use it for. Then they go back downstairs. Now in the afternoon, we could go to the fourth or the fifth day, and it can vary the length of time here. It's still building up still more in, in the afternoon. It's really building up. It's starting to hit. The rain's coming. Hit the rain's here. What happened? The fish moved up there in this thing, moved up to the break line, and out of the sanctuary depth, moved up to the break line for a while, and then he moved on up to the stop, to the stump at that break for a while, and then he moved on up to, to the pile of rocks at the, uh, around 10 feet. Now, the little fish have moved on in. We got a full movement. This is when the, the average guy will say the fish are biting. And even at 10 feet, 8 to 10 feet out there at that other break, I call those things on the structure of the bar a break. The guy casting the shoreline is not going to make contact with those people, those fish. You will note that in everything that we do as spoon pluggers, it's just about opposite from what everything else is. In this case, we will be casting out toward the deep water in all this area and we trolling out there instead of trolling along the shoreline or casting the shoreline. Because what we've gone through is usually what happens in this particular situation where we get a full movement doesn't occur very often. But when it occurs it might be there for uh, maybe a spoon plugger's already been in them and he probably didn't even wait to this point but when he gets to this point uh, maybe they're in there for, for milling around at that rock pile, the big, bigger fish. They may be in there for 30 or 40 minutes. And then they're going to go back downstairs. Slide. There again, that movement through the shoreline or toward the shoreline with a full movement. Weeds are not any weeds is a hot spot. 
and it's a hot spot due to the fish taking a certain path that led them there. That's the reason it's a hot spot. Slide. This is a kind of an exaggeration, but I want you to understand this. When I look at that group that gets up there around eight, ten feet, and you start saying the big fish, school of big fish, whoa, back up, we're getting too shallow. I usually will put that around two, two and a half pounds, let's say in a pass. The other smaller than that are not compatible with the big fish, so, so they've already scooted in the shallows, and they're pretty safe at that. Any big fish is related in some uh, way to, to that group of big fish, whether the group is two and a half pounds, three pounds, four pounds, five and five, three quarter pounds. The bigger fish is going to be related in some manner to that. Usually I, my guideline and your guide will be that when they move up, I better be sure that I check a little bit deeper because my answer this is my answer. I don't know what the biologist would say and don't care. That is, it looks to me like as the fish gets older and bigger, he can't adjust to the changes in his environment as fast or as readily as the smaller fish. And so that means if you're going to find any freaks, you better check a little bit deeper. It doesn't say. Sometimes uh, he may move up one or two, but uh, you just have to consider now that I'm not going to find all the big fish in here up around eight or ten feet where I'm practically scoop them up with a paddle. They're going to be deeper than that. They're going to be related and will not get too far from the deepest water in the area. As I say, that's the exaggeration, but this, you got to keep this in mind, because in your presentation of lures, you'll be able, if you hit that group up yonder, you'll be able to hit them. He'll be shallow enough to be reached. May not be uh, that far down. You may be at that break line. Slide. And then we go back downstairs. The sanctuary. So they go back that after that full movement with that rainy situation they go back downstairs that's the fourth or fifth day the sixth day you wake up and another pro front went through and she's washed out again so we have to start all over again that whole sequence now This is, this is something, if you will watch that and watch your weather map and everything, and it'll tell you when that rascal's going to go through. I watch the wind, and I can usually tell when one of the front is going to come through, how, and I watch the cloud cover, and I see how it's developing, and I can just about tell you uh, that uh, watching the wind, that the next day, that, that's going to, that, that thing right there, clear, washed out, Guy, the cold front's gone through. Here comes another cold front that went through. Cold front is usually associated with a low pressure area, which has a lot of moisture connected. It could be a squall line, it could be thunderstorms, it could be any, and then it could be so uh, small difference in there that, it, uh, that it's very little disturbance in front of that, and the front went through. But the light conditions, you can always see the light conditions will tell you that that was a front went through. You probably look at TV and you can see it, but your best bet is to watch it out here. 